Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome uh, everyone to this second panel of this year's Chernin Security Forum. The second panel is called Who's Security? Divisions in Europe on Threats and Security Responses. My name is Matusz Haas. I'm the head of the Center for European Security at the Institute of International Relations in Prague. And I will be joined by four distinguished speakers. Uh, Daniel Hegedusz, Susie Denison, Valerie Perry, and Vesna Pusic. I will introduce all the four speakers before their individual interventions in two or three sentences. But first, uh, let me start with a broad introduction to this uh, panel. Now, individual challenges, including the pandemics, including uh, Brexit, including uh, uh, five, six years ago, a Crimea annexation, they pose a, a threat uh, that are perceived differently across the Europe, differently uh, by different member states of the European Union or NATO. Uh, they are perceived differently by different groups within the uh, public or within the societies. Um, so the question is uh, how these differences can be uh, uh, straightened, up, straightened out. Uh, at the same time, there are different proposals for possible responses. So how to respond to individual threats, how to respond to individual challenges, what to do, how to deal with the situation itself. All these topics will be discussed by our four speakers, four panelists. Every panelist will have between 10 to 15 minute, minutes for their individual presentations. We will speak in the order as it is stated uh, in the program. So we will start with uh, Daniel Hegedush, then uh, uh, Susie Dennison. The third speaker will be Valerie Perry, and the last one will be Vesna Pusic. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you the first uh, speaker, who is Daniel Hegedush. He is a non-resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund and an expert on Central Europe. He deals with the democratic backsliding, as well as European and foreign policies of the Visegrad group of countries. That means the Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary. Uh, Mr. Hagedusz uh, studied and lectured both in Budapest and uh, in uh, Berlin. He worked before for Stiftung Wissenschaft Politik, as well as for Deutsche Gesellschaft für Auswärtige Politik, the DGAP. Uh, he's currently based in, uh, in Berlin. And I would like to ask Daniel, what do you think about current divisions uh, in Europe with respect to its security and how it is especially reflected uh, within the Visegrad group or uh, among uh, the EU member states? Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Matush, for the kind introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you for having me in this interviewing panel dedicated to the divisions in the threat perceptions of European countries. Um, in my contribution, I would like to cover, as mentioned, the Central and Eastern European region, aka the easternmost EU member states. And, uh, and I'm going to address the following three questions. First, whether we can talk about an east-west divided all in the threats and security perceptions of EU member states. Second, in close connection with the first one, whether we see distinct commonalities in the security policy formulation and security thinking of the CEE countries, the Central and Eastern European countries, and especially of the V4 countries, which in certain discussions often substitute the whole region. And third, what developments can we expect in the post-crisis period in the security thinking of the region? Um, it is rather fashionable since 2015 to use the argument of an existing East-West conflict or cleavage in European politics. The dichotomy soon spilled over from the EU asylum policy to various other issues of conflicts like the protection of the rule of law in the EU, energy transition, or even security policy. However, in my humble opinion, except the question of solidarity at the field of EU asylum policy, we can hardly find any facts that would support the existence of a clear-cut East-West divide in any policy fields, and especially not regarding the security and threat perceptions in Europe. 
mainly for two reasons. First, because the threat perceptions in Europe are in many respects converging and not diverging. Western, Southern and, and East Central European EU member states largely agree about the importance of cyber attacks, state collapse in the EU's neighborhood, may it be Libya or probably Belarus, international terrorism or uncontrolled mass migration. It's difficult to see outspoken regional differences here. ECFR scorecards are invaluable resources uh, here confirm this main trend of convergence and I am sure Susie Dennison will, will share more details uh, in this regard. And second, I think regarding the security issues which divides EU member states like the assertiveness of Russia, Chinese increasing influence or the EU's role uh, in, the e in the European security architecture, Central and Eastern European member states are largely divided themselves as well. To be honest, the threat perceptions within Central and Eastern Europe are much more diverging than in any other regions of Europe and much more diverging among the Visegrad countries than in any other minilateral formats in the EU, may it be the Benelux countries or, or the Baltic states. Therefore, there is simply no such thing as an Eastern threat perception in the European Union. While Poland, the Baltic states, and Romania perceive Russia as an existential threat, Hungary, Slovakia, and Bulgaria do not. The Polish position shows many commonalities with the threat perception of Western European countries like Denmark, Sweden, uh, or with the non-EU members in Norway, while the Hungarian one resembles the Austrian or the Italian one. Apparently, in the case of Russia, Geography matters much more than historical experience with Russian occupation or, or the country's communist past. Regarding China, at uh, the beginning, Central and Eastern European countries have been rather enthusiastic about the economic opportunities that opened up through the 16 plus one, later the 17 plus one process by the Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative, and in general by the developing relations with China just as the Western European countries have been rather enthusiastic. Today, the region is divided on the issue uh, as Europe itself. Poland, Romania and the Baltic countries hindered Huawei in participating in the 5G rollout in these countries, while Hungary embraced the Chinese company as a key vendor. However, even in the first case, Warsaw and Bucharest did not necessarily act on its own conviction, but mainly to comply with US expectations. Obviously, all CEE countries are suspicious about China's intentions and capabilities, but they carefully consider costs and benefits of the cooperation, uh, just like their, their Western European partners do. As the expectations toward Beijing are decreasing in the region due to the large trade imbalances and the often unrealized Chinese investment promises, it wasn't too difficult task for Washington to convince those countries to comply with its Huawei policy, where US security guarantees are perceived as a matter of life or death. Nevertheless, the diverging 5G policies may indeed cause long lasting security and foreign policy implications within Central and Eastern Europe, independently from the fact for whatever reason CE countries pursue these different policies. And Last but not least, Central and Eastern Europe is also divided on the EU's role in the se European security architecture. Obviously, all CEE countries agree that they see NATO as the prime security provider. That's not a surprise. Only a handful of European countries, France, Austria, or Finland support the idea that the EU should develop to an autonomous security community. Not even the non-NATO member state Sweden is convinced about this goal. However, while Poland and Romania often perceive debates and initiatives on increasing the EU's defense autonomy as impulses that they may weaken NATO and therefore undermine the organization that is so vital to their national security, the Baltic states and Bulgaria, on the other hand, are supporting an enhanced EU security cooperation. Bearing these arguments in mind, I think it's fair to say that the East-West divide is not a real existing policy divide at the field of security and foreign policy, but first of all, a mental and high political divide, which is mainly created by the discourse itself, 
that treats Central and Eastern Europe as a, as a homogeneous entity from a political perspective, although in fact it's, the, it's one of the most heterogeneous regions in, uh, in Europe. Um, switching our focus from, from the whole region to the Visegrad countries. As I mentioned before, the V4 is often referred to, and not only in the Western media, but also uh, often in the domestic discourse in these countries, as a sort of substitute for, for the whole Central European region, which is of course not. And especially if we take a look on the four constituting countries from north to south, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia and Hungary, one will realize that in the V4, not even two countries among the four share identical threat perceptions and security policy approaches, which underlines the fact that the Visegrad cooperation is still very far from an effective security cooperation format, and that treating it at EU level as a homogeneous group of countries is rather baseless. Obviously, Visegrad has a defense cooperation component and, and also a highly effective foreign policy component. In this latter regard, the Visegrad cooperation works as a sort of status multiplier and enables semi-institutionalized partnership on eye-to-eye -eye level with powers like India or recurring summits with, with the Prime Minister of Japan. However, the group is largely divided on any essential geopolitical issue in the region, may it be Russia, Ukraine, or in some extent, actually Belarus as well. Uh, just to underline it with, a, with an example, due to its cordial relation to Minsk and Moscow, Hungary first refrained from criticizing the stolen Belarusian presidential elections. Later, in order to avoid a potential conflict with Warsaw, its prime ally in the European Union, after weeks of hesitation, Hungary also signed up virtually to Poland's efforts in the Belarus crisis. But in fact, Budapest still maintains very cordial relations with the Lukashenko regime, including frequent and friendly exchanges at foreign minister level. Therefore, the Visegrad cooperation is not united by common foreign and security policy aspirations. It is united by the geopolitical necessity, certain advantages the coordination offers EU level, low key policy cooperation, and with an eye on the time passed by since 1991 when, when this cooperation format was established, tradition and, and history. And bearing in mind that neighborly relations have never been so cordial and constructive among these four countries as nowadays, I would still not underestimate the importance of the Visegrad format, although it's obvious that it lacks unity in strategic questions. Uh, the only burning issue uh, where the Visegrad countries and more or less the whole of Central and Eastern Europe is united is the refusal of solidarity with regard to the EU's asylum policy. However, I wouldn't like to open this box of Pandora uh, and therefore I only add that bearing in mind the European Commission's new pact on migration and asylum proposal and the flexible formats of solidarity it offers, um, Central and Eastern Europe's unity in the refusal of solidarity may perhaps also not last forever. And, uh, and how may the situation change in the post-COVID environment? Uh, I think the coronavirus crisis will definitely foster a more complex understanding of security, also in Central and Eastern Europe, that encompasses the robustness and resilience of public services. Uh, this change, not in the threat, but in the security perception, will be also well suited to an era when the first implications of the climate change will be increasingly noticeable during the post-coming decades. The COVID crisis might also put back the issue of economic security on the political agenda, uh, the perceived importance of which has been constantly decreasing uh, during the past decade since the chilling out of, uh, of the economic uh, crisis of 2008. And COVID may also help to understand, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, that the concepts and realities of effective governance on the one hand and the, the concept of a sovereign government on the other hand are far from being identical. It may underline that although several Central and Eastern European governments pursue autocratizing policies and narratives that are built around the concept of an unhindered national sovereignty, that sovereignty 
cannot necessarily be translated uh, into effective policy answers. Border closure can be an effective communication measure toward domestic electorate to signalize determination and power. But if it's not accompanied but by, uh, by appropriate healthcare and public policy measures, like for example, in my country of nationality during August and September, then it's only a further source of annoyance for, for citizens and uh, the government's responsibility for a policy failure under the conditions of isolation is hardly deniable. Uh, where I don't see a clear trend imposed by the COVID crisis is uh, the perception related to China. Uh, Beijing's assertive disinformation campaign in the first half uh, of the year hardly won any new friends for the People's Republic, uh, also not in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, while it significantly raised the concerns about China's goals and the tools it is ready to use to fulfill them. However, uh, with one eye on the economic repercussions of the crisis in Europe, and especially in Central and Eastern Europe, and the rather stable economic growth in, in China recently. In spite of the current trends of disillusionment, Central and Eastern Europe can ultimately end up being more exposed to Chinese investment and credit diplomacy and the repercussions at foreign policy level than they have been before the crisis broke out at, uh, at the end of, of 2019. And uh, practically that's all from me and about the divisions and, and possible perspectives uh, uh, of security thinking in Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you so much for your attention. I am very much looking forward to the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much for your uh, first intervention, for your comments, for your insights. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion after the fourth uh, panelist as well. Uh, and I'm especially looking towards uh, the, all the questions from the audience. So I would like to encourage our audience to uh, ask the questions and they will get to us uh, through our uh, support stuff. Uh, write the questions on Slido and we will receive them. Uh, our second panelist is uh, Susie Dennison. Susie Dennison uh, is a senior policy fellow at the uh, European Council on Foreign Relations, where she leads the European Power Programme, which explores how the European interest might shape the global issues and the environment, both globally and regionally. Uh, Susie Dennison uh, deals primarily with the European foreign and security policy, migration, cohesion within the EU, and human rights. She worked previously for the Amnesty International, but also for the Treasury Department of the United Kingdom. And she will speak about uh, recent public opinion data that they at the ECFR collected this year during the springtime. Uh, the data on security and uh, global issues. So Susie Dennison, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity um, to take part, part in this discussion. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be very much fun because I've got very little to disagree with in what Daniel just uh, presented. Um, but hopefully I can add a bit more colour and um, a bit of a sort of broader um, uh, perspective on um, other parts of Europe as well. Um, uh, from uh, the public opinion data that matters, you, you, you just mentioned um, we've worked on a TCFR. I'm going to try to share my screen um excuse me uh just to back up what i'm saying with a little bit of data so let's see if this works yeah hopefully you can all see um what i can see now um yeah essentially what we did um immediately um after the first wave of the coronavirus um pandemic started to recede in europe at ecfr was to carry out um, a large-scale public opinion poll to try and explore how the experience of covid19 um, had affected the way that citizens were thinking about the world we covered nine eu member states um uh so this was um uh at the end of May, begin, uh, end of April, sorry, beginning of May, um, uh, plus um, the UK. 
slightly later um, because of this effort to try and survey in each country just as they were coming out of the um, uh, uh, sort of peak of the crisis um, and, and to try to connect with the way um, that that was um, uh, affecting their, their views looking forward on, on the foreign policy dimension. Um, I just want to focus today on um, three sort of findings from that from that surveying, which seem pertinent to me um, regarding the way that um, Europeans are thinking about security after um, after COVID. Firstly, um, their their kind of relationship to Europe um, as an actor. Secondly, they're kind of thinking about what Europe can offer um, uh, in terms of uh, protection um, in, in the new global environment. And, and thirdly, this idea, which I think Daniel has alluded to as well, of a sort of perhaps a, a broader definition of security um, in terms of uh, what people are worried about. So firstly, um, this idea um, of, um, uh, of, of the need for Europe after the crisis. One of the most um, striking findings in all of the countries we looked at was this sense that um, during COVID, their country had been by itself. So when we asked who the most useful ally in the corona crisis was, um, as you can see from this chart, the largest answer in every EU state that we covered was no one. My country had to deal with this um, by itself. Um, in terms of the, the, the kind of EU level action, um, there, there's, there's a kind of real um, uh, tangible disappointment um, uh, in terms of um, uh, what, what Europe did on, on, on the health pandemic um, at the beginning. Um, you can see here the red answers are those who um, disagree or strongly disagree with the idea that the European Union has lived up to its responsibilities. And perhaps even more striking, you can see when we ask the question about um, um, how they would characterize the EU during the crisis, the idea of EU irrelevance um, uh, is very big and 47% um, um, across the EU as a whole um, characterized um, the EU in this way um, uh, on, on the health crisis. This um, kind of idea that um, Europeans feel let down um, is not exclusive to the EU. Um, there has been massive damage to um, perceptions of, um, of the US in Europe um, by, by the coronavirus um, crisis. Um, you can see that um, in every um, country uh, that, that we looked at, the largest answer, majorities everywhere except for Italy, Poland and Bulgaria, where there are still large minorities, said that their perception of the US had deteriorated um, during this crisis. And um, very few answered that the US had been an important ally um, uh, on, on Corona. Um, that the, the sort of the largest um, uh, answer where there was a sense that the US had been supportive was in Italy, but this was still very small indeed, around 6%. Um, echoing as well what Daniel said in his presentation, um, China hasn't done very well out of the crisis in European perceptions um, either. So this idea of kind of mass diplomacy doesn't seem to have paid off. Um, opinions of, of China, the largest answers everywhere again, um, were, were that um, they had worsened um, during the experience of the crisis. And interestingly also, um, I haven't got the data on this slide, but when we asked about who um, uh, citizens blamed for the scale of the outbreak in their country, um, China's handling of the, the crisis at the beginning um, looms quite large in, in the answers there as well. And then interestingly, um, I find this interesting um, on uh, the, the, the question on, of, of what role Russia has played on the crisis. It really looks from our survey um, in the spring that Russia just doesn't sort of loom very large for anybody um, uh, uh, in terms of their thinking about um, uh, allies um, uh, in, in terms of the kind of the, the, the current threats. Um, it's, it's obviously a mixed picture and there are kind of differences um, in, in different countries in terms of um, their, their, their perceptions of um, uh, of Russia. But um, yeah, it, it, it sort of doesn't seem to kind of feature um, as, as large in the post COVID mindset um, as uh, as perhaps had been the case before. But Coming back to this idea of Europe, um, there is um, nevertheless a strong sense that um, the, the lack of European leadership was the, not the way it should have been. So 63% um, across all of Europe answered that they felt um, that coronavirus showed the need for more international cooperation, not less. Um, 
that breaks down differently in different member states, um, it is a majority answer uh, in, in all member states that we covered in all different parts. <clears throat> and strikingly, um, coming back to Daniel's first presentation, um, if you look at Poland, um, if you look at Bulgaria, um, you get um, uh, slightly stronger uh, majorities than perhaps um, in, in some of the kind of um, uh, older um, EU member states um, that you can see lower down. Um, so um, I think this this sense that um, uh, uh, that the, the current inst institutions were disappointing is not at the cost of the idea um, of, of European level cooperation being a helpful thing. Coming on to this question of how Europe should change after the crisis, gratifyingly for an organisation like ECFR that I work with, um, where we focus on foreign policy, the biggest answer um, that we got um, was that Europe should ensure a more unified response to global threats and challenges. Um, this also was pre-recovery um, fund and MFF deal, um, this survey, um, but you can see there that you've got a large answer too um, in support of um, sharing the financial burden um, of the crisis. And coming back to, um, to Daniel's presentation too, the third biggest answer is the need for more control over the EU's external borders. Now, my personal view is that we can't read much um, from this um, finding into um, views about migration. I see this as very much a response to um, citizens seeing the need for governments to be in control and seeing borders as a kind of tool that um, governments now need to be able to use um, in handling um, global pandemics. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's quite strikingly there. But I want to focus on the fourth biggest answer, actually, this um, idea that businesses should be pushed to produce more medical supplies in the EU, even if this means higher price, uh, prices. Um, this idea of e economic sovereignty, Europe being able to kind of look after itself at an economic level seems to be um, something that has strengthened um, as a result of the experience of not being able to get the supplies that, that um, countries needed early on in the crisis. Um, and this sense that um, uh, that long supply chains represent a vulnerability um, in, in this kind of new world that we have to learn to live with. And this Binding was particularly strong in France and Germany. Um, uh, you can see here dark blue is um, for the idea of uh, supplies in the EU, lighter blue is um, for other essential goods and services. Um, but uh, yeah, this is particularly um, key in, in France and Germany. And then um, just on this idea of this broader definition of security, it's clear that the corona crisis didn't cancel out the growing um, support that we saw pre-corona um, for um, uh, climate and European sensitivity which for the need to be pre prepared for the next um, emergency situation. Um, and uh, you can see that in every country there is um, more support uh, for climate action, um, more reported support um, than pre crisis um, uh, which uh, is quite clear. Interesting that Sweden and Denmark are the smallest answers here. Um, I read that as being about the kind of the question we, we asked during the crisis on climate action and perhaps um, thesis. So just, um, just to finish, um, I think um, I would very much echo um, the, the point which Daniel um, closed on about this, um, this sense that European um, uh, security is, is no longer just about, um, uh, if it ever was, um, the sort of uh, the, the core security dimensions that, that we're used to thinking about. The sort of the climate component is very strongly there. I think this, this idea of kind of um, resilience of health services and, and broader public services, but also economies um, from this crisis um, is very important too. And there's also um, a growing sense of, of, a, um, of a need for us to kind of pay more attention to, to digital sovereignty, if, 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 if you like, um, the need to, um, uh, to ensure that we have the technology that we need um, to, um, to respond to, to, to future um, issues. So um, I, I will leave it there. Um, uh, but I think um, that these, yeah, these, these sort of broader um, areas, this broader definition of um, security sort of very much um, echoes the need, um, uh, sort of maps the needs that Europeans see to engage with different actors, perhaps in different ways. Thank you, Susie. Thank you for your 
contribution to this uh, panel on uh, who security. Uh, I think it's very important insights again from uh, your public opinion uh, data on important issues of uh, Europe in post-corona uh, era. Uh, I again encourage uh, all the participants, uh, the whole audience to ask the questions. They will get to us the questions themselves. And I would like to introduce the third speaker in our panel, which is Valerie Perry. Uh, she is a senior associate at the Democratization Policy Council and an expert on Western Balkans, where she lived and worked for many years since the late 1990s. Uh, during her career, she consulted or worked for numerous uh, inter intergovernmental bodies, organizations, NGOs, such as uh, NATO S4, uh, USAID, United Nations Development uh, Program, uh, OECE, or the OECE missions uh, to Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, as a PhD graduate from the George Mason University, she also wrote and edited numerous articles and books uh, on the Western Balkans. And the Valerie will draw important parallels between uh, uh, disintegration trends in the former Yugoslavia and the current crisis of uh, uh, liberal democracies and liberal democracy as such. So Valerie, the floor is yours. Great. No, thank you for that introduction. Um, no, I, th I think I, I'd like to sort of uh, take this discussion that's been set out quite nicely by the first two speakers and move it into the Western Balkan region, uh, which has the potential to be, you know, really a, that one of the next parts of the broader European Union and transatlantic partnership, but which unfortunately is at risk from a number of uh, domestic and regional uh, threats and factors, but also some of these global factors that we've been talking about so far. And I find it interesting as, as someone studying politics in the region to uh, wonder whether or not we're seeing the region necessarily improve in terms of some of its adherence to uh, the democratic rule of law, rights-based systems, and uh, equitable economic systems or whether we're now seeing you know, the West decline. And in either case, whether we might be seeing some odd convergence that we might not have suspected as we see these global threats playing out on the world stage. Um, as has been noted already, the uh, impact of COVID-19 has, has been significant and has really revealed and sharpened a number of existing uh, fault lines that we can see in societies, politics, and economies everywhere. Um, this is culminating in terms of eroding of faith and trust in uh, democ democracy as a system in elements of the rule of law in many places. It's exacerbating some of the in income inequality that much of the world has been experiencing and from which we never really uh, recovered since the 2008 financial crisis. Um, the looming th threat of climate change is, is clear, both in terms of what we're seeing with the uh, uh, migrations, but also people's impressions about what to do um, in terms of both migration and also whether or not countries are willing to take the steps necessary to try to start making this shift. Um, in the Western Balkans, uh, countries are experiencing these, these broader phenomenon, but we're also seeing a number of uh, hastening um, threats uh, in the region as, as well that are linked to these current phenomenon, but also quite often have roots in some of the uh, trends and the divisions that we saw in the 1990s. Uh, the rhetoric of division is, is heated and seems to know no bounds in terms of a combination of historical revisionism, but also outright hostility, both towards opposition, but also um, different neighbors, um, many of whom were uh, at war in the early 1990s. And, and, and this turbocharged weaponization of history, both distant and past, is definitely contributing to more schisms in societies and in politics and more othering of national minorities uh, and citizens who want to basically exist as a citizen as opposed to perhaps aligning with some of the main groups. And, and this is not uh, unintentional and it's not even necessarily in the service of any ideology. It's very much been in the service of broader state and party capture. And when we're seeing this through strengthened and continuing corruption, 
uh, and patronage in the systems throughout the region. Um, and, and it's been interesting to observe this because we're seeing this play out in terms of uh, governance and different types of um, uh, publicly owned enterprises, but also this, this seepage into the failed transition uh, into more market oriented systems and a warping of the lauded goal of public-private partnerships in a region where there's not necessarily the economic or the legal um, will and foundation to move that forward. And, and I think one of the most uh, frustrating elements that we're seeing and characteristics we're seeing is a broader loss of vision and hope after about a quarter century or more of of uh, developments in the region. And we're seeing this quite strongly in terms of um, out-migration as uh, citizens, families, young people who have quite often been trying to sort of make a go at it in any of the countries of the region are finally and firmly giving up. And, and this is different than previous waves of uh, migration that we've seen in the Western Balkans in the past because we're now seeing whole families leaving um, and quite often without an intention of returning. And this is going to result in a devastating uh, lack of uh, social and human capital in the future. Um, it, it's frustrating because it didn't really have to be that way. And for a certain period of time, we really did know what worked in terms of international engagement and encouragement to try to prepare the Western Balkans broadly to join um, and integrate more to the transatlantic alliance. Um, and this support worked when a number of factors were in place. One was when all of the different elements of the international community uh, were on the same page, whether that would be the, um, the European Union, uh, the, United States, uh, the United States, uh, various international organizations, Canada, Norway, Japan, some of the different liberal actors who all had an interest in seeing progress. When they were on the same page in terms of policy interests and goals, then there was progress. But when there was space between these different agendas or approaches, we saw that these spaces were very quickly filled by either domestic or external liberal, uh, illiberal actors. And, un and unfortunately, all of these different um, pressures that we've seen over the past several years have increased the frequency with which there's been space among these different um, Western agendas, which really should have a bit more in common. Um, progress was also more evident when the the West was better at picking partners, whether that would have been political partners that they were supporting and aligning with, um, or also civic citizen partners. And, and unfortunately, recently we've seen that the, the overriding interest in just supporting this false notion of stability has meant that a continuing partnership with elite political actors who quite often don't have the same shared interest in progressive reform means that the West is really supporting an ineffective status quo that is very much against the change and the reform that we say is necessary to try to move towards European Union integration. Um, and while we see this very acutely with the political parties and partnerships in that sense, we also see this in terms of a lack of support for some of the more forward looking voices of, of, of change coming up from the bottom up among citizens groups. A, a, a lot has been written about the fact that different efforts to support civil society by all sides um, has actually created an infantilized civil society segment um, that is more interested in project delivery and project implementation as opposed to supporting citizen and civic interests to be a more constructive check and balance against the ruling elites. And unfortunately, we're sort of seeing the challenges in that aspect. There are some glimmers of hope with regard to some environmental movements uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina and particularly as we're seeing growing frustration among people who see that their local environment are being exploited and destroyed without any uh, role um, from the communities that are being the most effective. So that gives some faint glimmers of hope in an otherwise very uh, grim situation. And, and then third, their progress in this region was, was more effective when incentives were more effectively used. Um, unfortunately, since visa liberalization uh, basically gave the very necessary carrot of uh, travel for citizens, um, 
the funding and the structural funding and the opportunities that can come along with the promise of EU enlargement and integration have very often just failed to make it to the vast majority of people, uh, leading people to um, lose faith in the process, lose faith in the vision of a future in your Atlantic institutions, and also quite often having um, funding as some of the uh, local elite political projects that are more interested in siphoning off some of these external funds to patronage elements within the system as opposed to the broader good. So really, unfortunately, in a nutshell, especially in the past 10 years, 10, 12 years, uh, not only has the West failed in terms of spoiler management in some of these um, uh, post-war and conflict adult areas, but now a lot of times we're seeing that the spoilers are act actively uh, dictating the agenda, uh, which is ironic since uh, this, the future membership in the, the EU and funds are coming from the outside. Um, it's very easy to lose faith and lose focus on what we once were working towards in, in the region. And, and it's easy to forget that 25 years ago when the, when the wars in, in Bosnia and then you know, 21 years ago when the fighting and the war in Kosovo ended, that there had been a period of time when there was interest in more of a values-based foreign and democratization policy um, by the West uh, in those countries, but then also being operationalized in the region. Um, and this vision uh, being grounded more in a democratic liberal peace was novel. It was part of the sort of the heyday in the post-Cold War time when there was a sense that, you know, democracy in a rules-based order uh, grounded in human rights was not just something that was important for certain countries, but would contribute to a comprehensive security environment more broadly around the world. Um, and this was very different than a, a zero-sum rail politique approach that had dominated during the Cold War and was also a bit more nuanced uh, than what we had seen. And, and this grounding in development and democratization uh, did help to move uh, countries forward and did help to create a new vision for the post-Cold War world um, that was imperfect, but at least was able to provide a vision for where the world could go in um, as we all move forward. Um, and instead, especially since around 2015, but rooted in some of the events that came uh, prior to that, uh, most the 9-11, the, uh, the war in Iraq and the financial crisis, uh, we've seen this return to more of a narrow transactionalism. Uh, this is vividly seen in Trump's scattershot approach to um, international relations and his allies. Um, but it's also evident in an EU policy in the Western Balkans that has progressively lowered the bar in terms of short-term technical wins rather than support for a more long-term commitment to values. Um, looking forward, it, it's, it's difficult to really um, feel optimistic until we see what happens uh, over the next two months, uh, one, two, three months uh, globally. And most notably, I'm, I'm very worried about the upcoming uh, U.S. elections in November, um, because that's going to be very pivotal in terms of setting a global scene and in the future for all of these issues I've been talking about so far. Um, a, a Trump win uh, in November uh, would take the U.S. off the scene entirely in terms of any constructive role on trying to fix some of these issues. Uh, NATO would be at risk, and so the entire Euro-Atlantic um, alliance and, and, and vision would suddenly be at risk in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, we would also see that some of the narrow transactional approaches as indicated by the, um, the very cosmetic a deal related to Serbia and Kosovo would continue to move on and would continue to seek sort of um, cosmetic and superficial progress without addressing some of these drivers and certainly without being um, rooted in any stronger sort of values led vision of domestic and foreign policy. Um, in this kind of scenario, the EU, Canada, Norway, Japan and others would be left to try to scramble and find a way to start pres preserving some sort of a semblance of a liberal order until the US would be able to get um, back on their feet. Um, in this fairly negative dystopia, in, in my opinion, um, we, we know how this alternative would really play out. Um, extremism and polarization has been rising in, in the US, but also globally, and this would continue in the, in the unmoored environment in which we would no longer have um, a genuine transatlantic alliance. Um, and the manipulation of populations in this environment of heightened extremism magnified by the media um, would at the same time mobilize uh, bad actors to try to exploit this while 
frustrating and discouraging possible um, positive actors and liberal actors to tune out, uh, feeling overwhelmed by the news cycle and feeling hopeless um, after seeing witnessing the failure of some democratic institutions. Um, and as a next step, you can really never disentangle these different trends um, from the rise in corruption and state capture and kleptocracy globally. I think what we've seen happening in Hungary and, and also moving on in Poland, as well as in clearly illiberal states uh, like Brazil and Russia, um, shows that in a globalized world, um, kleptocrats and oligarchs are able to very ex effectively exploit um, offshoring and financial institutions in a way that they're able to strip assets away from the people, further weakening um, domestic situations and consolidating their control. And I think we would see that um, hastening, unfortunately, and, and the Brexit crisis would feed into that as well. Um, in the event of a Biden administration, then there's at least an attempt to start to try to not hit a reset on all of these processes, but to try to start to reconstruct some of these relationships and um, agendas that have been fundamentally destroyed over the past several years. Uh, this could be rooted in a recalibrated Western Balkan uh, approach, looking at Serbia, Kosovo, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, North Macedonia, but really the region as a whole, but really being grounded, not just in the sense that the West knows everything as, uh, as we all sort of thought to 20, 25 years ago, but more in a sense of how do we rebuild to prevent any further possible backsliding and how do we learn from the threats in some of our own countries as we've seen the rise of far right wing parties uh, throughout Europe and, and also then in the United States. How can we try to fix institutions in the US, in the West, while at the same time supporting a strengthening of independent institutions and participatory governance in the Western Balkans? And while this may sound quite grim, I actually am a, a frustrated idealist in this because I think we're seeing more and more that people are people do see that things aren't working the way they should. Millennials in particular are not happy with the world they've grown up in, bookended by the financial crisis and now the pandemic. And there are people globally who want to be networked and positively mobilized to try to push back against some of these downward trends we've seen. And I think one of the big questions we need to look at in terms of 2021, regardless of what these, this outcome would be in the US election, would be how to harness um, this positive energy that's really been marginalized. Uh, we've seen that some of the more negative extremist groups um, have very effectively mobilized people and made them feel like they're a part and either um, ISIS inspired or far right wing movements. Um, but how can we try to harness more positive uh, sentiments and create more of a sense of positive radicalization so that um, all of the countries in the transatlantic sphere can try to develop in a more positive forward moving way to rebuild after some of the destructive um, trends over the past several years. So I hope we can discuss this during the conversation. And that was a big brain dump, but um, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. And I, I'm really thankful that you ended up uh, on a positive note, despite a, a rather gloomy picture that you have depicted uh, of both the region and, uh, and the global affairs. Uh, and uh, I believe that many concepts that concepts that you've mentioned uh, are very important also with respect to our fourth speaker, because, uh, uh, Ms. Vesna Pusic, because she will speak about populism and the uh, current uh, foreign policy challenges of the European Union and the concepts like, uh, I mean, laws of faith, laws of vision, uh, but also polarization within the society, state capture, that they are all related with each other and also related to the political elite and its relations with respect to the society and how populism works and why it gains support. So uh, the last speaker will be Vesna Pusic. Uh, she's a well-known politician and scholar of, of the Croatian origin and active at the national as well as international level, former first deputy prime minister, uh, minister of foreign affairs, uh, and uh, and uh, for many years also a member of parliament uh, in Croatia. She's still active in uh, Croatian politics uh, uh, in the Croatian uh, civic, liberal, civic liberal 
alliance called GLASS. Uh, as an outspoken liberal and a professor of sociology, she was uh, vice president of what is now known as ALDA group within the uh, European Parliament. Uh, and as I said, Ms. Pusic will speak about populism and how it relates uh, also to foreign policy and the European Union. So, Ms. Pusic, the floor is yours. Thank you very I... much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here in, in this company and, and discuss these issues that um, for us have sort of an immediate impact, not only on the way we think, but also on the way we live and we survive in this environment of both Europe and uh, obviously Southeastern Europe or, or Western Balkans where Croatia, although it is a member of the European Union, for the, it has been for the last seven years, um, I also believe it belongs to the Balkans and in that sense also has a responsibility uh, for the improvement and, and sort of catching up if you want, although I'm not sure that's exactly what's on the agenda at the moment because when we were fighting for, let's say, what we thought were normal states, by which we meant liberal democratic states in the 90s, and early 2000, we thought that we might be at the tail end of sort of this authoritarian type of political thinking of uh, political populists that use nationalism in order to whip up support. Um, the way things turned out, uh, actually in the early 90s, I wrote an article uh, with the title Dictatorships with a Democratic Legitimacy, which could easily translate into illiberal democracy. At that time, that term wasn't known, and Adam Michnik used this article and sort of coined the, the uh, term democratura, meaning you have electoral legitimacy, but actually govern in an authoritarian or dictatorial uh, manner. But at that time, we thought we were the last of the Mohicans. We were actually now going to go into a completely different mode, into high standards in human rights, into uh, liberal democratic institutions, procedures, etc. Looking at it from today's perspective, it seems that in many ways we were the front runners because a lot of all democracies, including the, uh, what we thought was paramount democracy, the United States, uh, followed in our footsteps rather than uh, moved in, the, in a different direction. So we are facing a world in which what we thought uh, we were leaving through also our European Union project, we were actually now facing globally. And I want to emphasize, before I go into this, this topic, I want to emphasize that I am a passionate European. I'm emphasizing that because I will be critical of Europe, I will be critical of the European Union. I'm, passion, I'm a passionate EU supporter, always, always have been. And the other thing I would like to, to sort of say at the beginning is that the whole concept of security in Europe has gone through tectonic changes, has gone through dramatic changes in the last few years, specifically uh, in the last four years. Um, before that, we always thought that you know, NATO was the guarantor of European security and European and US partnership was the guarantor of European security. We, uh, Europe and the US mostly stood on the same side in different international organizations. And this was, even when it wasn't spelled out, this was sort of self-understood. This has changed. And this 
realization, I don't think will change with the result of the American elections. I think that, of course, it's paramount. It's extremely important who wins in the American elections in November for a number of reasons, which I won't go into at this moment. But as far as Europeans understanding of having the US as a guarantor of its uh, security and having the US as a sort of uh, trailblazer in terms of, of uh, international initiatives, on, uh, in terms of global stability, that trust is gone. Uh, because what we have realized as Europeans, and I think this has to be the starting point of rethinking the concept of European sec security, what we have realized is that this can be the case, but it can also easily change. And when it, change, when it changes, Europe is on its own more or less, and it needs to sort of think of a way of having a position. Now, what I think is um, the other important issue, apart from this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, how can I say, disappointed uh, love affair be between Europe and, and the United States, um, what is the other issue is that Europe that we knew in the 90s and also until I would say the fin financial crisis of 2007, 2008, um, that Europe is also gone. That was a Europe of uh, not only economic prosperity, but of general agreement on basic values. Uh, the European governments were liberal democratic, or liberal democratic wannabes on the way to becoming uh, liberal democratic. The new European uh, member states were led by people who were, I would say, looked up to as, as examples of you know, human rights, uh, human, hu human rights uh, advocates of people with high uh, standards in terms of both democratic procedure and, and sort of good polity. This is also gone. Uh, other people have come up in the process uh, as rulers or as key uh, politicians in uh, Eastern Europe, but in you know, became important politicians throughout uh, Europe. So I would say that this division between uh, politicians and leaders who advocate, still advocate liberal democracy and politicians and leaders who are either uh, in government and are populist or are leading important and strong political parties uh, with substantial support in some uh, European countries that are populists has um, split Europe into two groups that are A, suspicious of each other, and uh, B, have a relatively low opinion of each other. Uh, I would say that populist leaders think that the liberal Democrats are naive, old fashioned and boring. And liberal Democrats think that populists are crooks. And mostly they're both right. And this is something that we have to somehow face and deal with. Uh, the populists have mastered the art of election. And this, I think, is a key thing. Uh, because we used to think that multi-party, relatively free, or let's say the elections where uh, the government is not stuffing the ballot box directly and physically, which we've also seen in some parts, um, that this is a guarantee of democracy. Of course, we never thought and never, it never occurred to us that that was all there is. 
But the populists have actually managed to persuade because it's simple, it's understandable, and they have managed to persuade a lot of people in some countries, the majorities, that multi-party elections equals democracy. That uh, winning in multi-party elections means or gives you the right to do whatever you want. And it's quite common that you hear the answer when you criticize these governments, what do you want? We won the elections. In other words, after we won the elections, we can do whatever we please because people gave us that support or, or uh, that legitimacy. Also, something populists have in common is having an opportunistic, I'm going to say, a, a, a valueless approach to choosing allies. Uh, this is this can be called transactional politics. It can be called opportunistic politics, but basically what it is is um, it supports this approach for everyone or every country for itself. In other words, if I can profit from an alliance, short-term alliance uh, with a country that otherwise undermines uh, the European Union or Europe as we see it and have it at, at the moment, so be it. I will do that. It will prove that I'm smart. Um, so it's not only a competition among member states in choosing these alliances and, and forming these, uh, choosing these allies and forming these alliances, but it's also a competition between individual states trying to outsmart the European Union. And that is something that shows, hmm, if it were children, you would say it shows that they're spoiled. They've been spoiled but ha by having it very good for a long time. And by um, not valuing or not understanding or not, you know, uh, taking into account the fact that this European Union that we have is, has taken enormous amount of effort, uh, first of all, to be built, and it will take enormous amount of effort to maintain it. And that it's our only chance, even for big countries like Germany and France, it's our only chance to matter in a global world, to have a say and, and be present in a global world. Uh, this division that we have within uh, the European Union at, at the moment, um, I think is probably the greatest threat to uh, European security because it prevents us to form opinions or to form positions and to take action. Um, just a small uh, footnote, there is an audio book by Misha Glenny called The Iron Man, where he speaks about, uh, I think, five or six uh, populist leaders, some of them European, some of them from the countries of uh, the European Union, uh, they're all people who came into power through elections, but are ruling as autocrats, not to say dictators, uh, to, to uh, autocrat, I think is really only a, a little bit more polite way of actually, uh, uh, looking at people who are using dictatorial powers. Um, populist governments are present in Europe, they're present in the European Union, they're present in uh, NATO. Uh, this is the reason why, for instance, uh, something that has been also mentioned by, by previous speakers, why, for instance, um, it took European Union, I don't know how many weeks, uh, to adopt adopt a position on Belarus and on Lukashenko not being elected president, but still taking that uh, position. Uh, 
this is why uh, Europe, and I was, by the way, in the room when I heard the high representative of American administra administration, who was at that time vice president and, and uh, currently the candidate and, and I think future president of the United States, Joe Biden, uh, when he said, Europe needs to take seriously and take uh, con uh, focused action on Syria. We have had the war in Syria, America had uh, Iraq, America had Afghanistan, and they were really expecting European Union to you know, be more proactive, have a position, be involved in uh, negotiating peace and finding, uh, or at least contributing to the end of the war in Syria, which is, by the way, as we all know, on our doorstep. And Europe didn't do anything, and or more or less, there was some help, but not much. Uh, uh, certainly wasn't the key player in finding a solution to uh, and the end to that that war. It was Russia, and it's there. It's it's we forgot about it. Uh, this is not only an issue of of being just of preventing tragedy. This is a di has direct uh, uh, impact on European security. Uh, as we speak, there is the war going on in Nagorno-Karabakh. The whole world is pretending it doesn't exist. If this was happening 10 years ago, even five years ago, we would all be up in the air. We would be discussing it. There will be you know, all kinds of things happening. We don't even mention it. We don't even bother to to you know, watch the news about it on on uh, television. The, Nagorno Karabakh, arguably, is Europe, and definitely our immediate neighborhood. Both countries are part of Eastern Partnership of uh, the European Union. So this is also something that shows that Europe is incapable in under these circumstances of forming a position, of forming a position because uh, there are different alliances in, among uh, uh, the European member states that they're more concerned with than there are with our own European unity and, and security. And I want to mention just one thing that I think is contributing to that and it's the famous liberum veto uh, within the European Union, or the fact that foreign policy and security issues are being decided on unanimously. This has obviously been a serious problem. This has, in our European history, destroyed at least one country, this was Poland, historically. Uh, at the same time, Europe has this, this problem of, of if you introduce or, or use dual major qualified majority, can European institutions, can Europe survive that? Is it too fragile to actually be unified in its security and foreign policy? I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pusic, for your contribution. And I will try to link one or two questions also from the audience, exactly to what you said. You said that the U.S. is not anymore a trailblazer, and uh, the EU or the Europe is not anymore what it what it was used to be. So, well, and connecting that to to other presentations, I would maybe like to hear the opinion of uh, Susie and uh, and Valerie and uh, Daniel. On, on one issue that was not mentioned that much, that is a solidarity uh, among both countries of the Visegrad group, of the European Union within the societies, whether it is uh, societies of the Western Balkans or the societies uh, uh, in Europe, according to public opinion data, uh, and how that relates to 
a, a lack of a role model. I mean, who is the role model today? It's not anymore the US, it's not anymore Western Europe. Uh, shall we be the role model, the European Union as such? How do you see that? Uh, Valerie, Susie, Daniel, and, and well, is China role model, at least with respect to how it handles the corona at the beginning and later? What do you think? Maybe I could come in um, first. Um, I'm, I've got an unstable connection, so I want to come in while it's working. Um, but um, j just um, on on this question, um, it, it's, it seems to me that um, there is a kind of a distinct realization at European level that um, of this kind of I love the disappointed love affair um, idea that um, that uh, Ms. Ms. Puzic put, put forward for, for the transatlantic relationship now. And I think that's that's exactly right, that there is still this kind of idealistic vision among Europeans about the kind of the, the deep connection, um, which I think they see as much at their kind of national level as a, having a kind of special relationship with Europe, uh, with sorry, with the US um, than uh, as they do at European level. Um, we did a survey last year where we asked exactly that question, whether your country has a special relationship with the US and, and every single EU state thinks it does. Um, but, um, but I think um, that there is still this kind of growing sense of realism about what that can actually deliver. And I think that um, Europe is really at this kind of, um, I don't know if you'd call it a transitional stage, but a kind of a turning point where it recognizes the need to take more responsibility for itself, whether you call that strategic autonomy, whether you call that kind of sovereignty, because as I try to highlight, I think there are elements of this that are very much centered around the kind of economic dimensions and that the kind of the need for more resilience in European systems um, uh, uh, and, and fields like technology and so on. Um, but, um, but at the same time, there is this kind of holding back for fear of um, what we will lose further for, um, in, in the US relationship, when it, whether it comes to kind of investment more in a sort of European pillar of NATO or whatever, there's this kind of distinct um, nervousness about um, taking the plunge that Europeans kind of feel they need to take. And maybe that, that nervousness comes partly for the, from, the, from the, the, the fact that indeed there is no kind of obvious role model now. There is no one telling us what to do. We are on our own. Um, I think China certainly isn't the model. Um, in terms of um, either the way that, um, that that people think the pandemic was handled there, um, but also the kind of the very competitive, aggressive um, relationship between between China and the U.S. I think Europeans don't want that either. Um, they, they they want to be a kind of a, a big enough actor not to have to choose um, in conflicts between the U.S. Um, and, and 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 other actors. But at the same time, um, uh, they're, they're they're nervous about sort of taking that responsibility on. So I think. Um, I think it, it, it really will be a kind of a testing time for the project over the next few years because this seems to be one of the areas where there's a great weight of expectation on the European level if it chooses if the kind of institutions can deliver on that then then they can kind of prove their purpose to European citizens um, but if they don't um, in some ways I think that there's a big risk that those the citizens will start to think well you know what actually does the European level add to the national level of government in this kind of scary environment. Thank you, I agree with that. Uh, Daniel, Valerie, would you like to add anything? What do you think about that? No, I mean, I think um, I, I agree that there is no role model, and I think that's a good thing. I think it's dangerous when you only have one country that's sort of seen as a role model with all the answers because um, that was never the case, and nor should it have been the case, and now it's been demonstrably proven. Um, I think role models should be more uh, grounded in um, systems and value structures underpinning the institutions of, of governance at all levels, um, as opposed to being linked to any one country, culture, or group. Um, yeah, that makes it more attainable as well for everybody. Um, I'm glad Matus said you used the term solidarity. And I'm, I'm wondering though, if looking at some of the divides and schisms that we're seeing within countries, within the different member states of the EU, the US, et cetera, 
I wonder if there's going to be more of a likelihood of creating solidarities across interest groups and populations, um, as opposed to simply just between countries. Um, among people, I mean, we're already seeing this happen among the far right, to be honest, I mean, who are organizing very effectively online and across borders, using different uh, platforms and messages. Um, we're not, and we're, we're seeing some of that as well on other issues. I mean, we're the Climate Fridays and some of the environmental actions are reaching out globally and creating these transnational solidarity networks, which I think give some hope. The issue, though, is whether or not some of these different issues based solidarity movements can then also coalesce into um, sort of operationalizable policy platforms to sort of move things forward. And, and in, in that case as well, I think that um, we're going to, I, I hope that we'll see some interesting ideas, especially from the millennial generation who is, uh, they're digital natives, they've grown up with these crises, they see the future as bleak for them. And I think they're also recognizing what does and does not work for them in terms of governance and accountability. So, so perhaps we'll be getting some ideas that the people on this panel aren't even necessarily thinking of yet. Dan thank you very much, uh, Valerie. And now, Daniel, you have an uh, opportunity to have a last few remarks. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, I will keep it, keep it concise. I absolutely agree uh, that we don't have a uh, a role model. I think the greater problem is that we also don't have a stable systemic model anymore, because both free market economy, uh, electoral democracy, and the concept of open society were fundamentally shattered, unfortunately, by the past crisis since, since 2008. And unfortunately, we see the results uh, in, in the cohesion of the European Union. I, I really liked uh, Wesner's remark on the outsmarting of the European Union. And definitely what we see is practically a free rider disrupting mentality that member states both exploits the benefits of the European integration and would like to capitalize the benefits also on cooperation and, uh, and the non-commitment to, to European, uh, to European uh, rules. And of course, we see it everywhere in the European Union, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but uh, first and more, uh, foremost in Central and, and Eastern Europe, where with the words of Ivan Krastev, these societies and member states were used to the situation that they are imitating external models. And uh, when these external models vanished, what we see is, is more or less a situation of, uh, of lacking, lacking values. And, uh, and it's a good question how it will really impact uh, the future. I also very much like the question on, on solidarity and, uh, and whether we can somehow preserve the integrity uh, of the European Union under the conditions when, for example, we have majoritarian decision making in all fields of the European Union, including foreign policy, because we have seen majoritarian decisions in the European Union, which should have been implemented because they were compulsory, but they were simply neglected by the member states and, and left unimplemented. So therefore, I cannot offer any wise solutions uh, to these problems, just to agree with, uh, with my co-speakers about the seriousness of the challenges we are, we are facing. And, uh, and hopefully we will have a bit more clear perspectives uh, on the morning of 4th of November. So thank you so much. Thank you. Unsurprisingly, we raised more questions than answered, the, uh, answered them. Uh, anyway, with that, I would like to uh, thank all four uh, our panelists, and that is Vesna Pusic, Valerie Perry, Susie Dennison, and uh, Daniel Hagedush. And I would also like to thank them all for a wonderful panel and emphasize and stress that the next panel will be an expert discussion of a paper wrote, written and uh, prepared by my colleague and also the main organizer of the whole event, Asya Mechajeva. So I would like to uh, invite and welcome everyone to attend the, the panel. Thank you very much.